before and after um, a conversation I had with um, photographer Busola Dakolo. We had heard so many stories of other people um, who claimed that they had been assaulted or raped by Biodun Fatoyibo, who is the founder of the Commonwealth of Zion Assembly. Many of them were afraid to speak up because they claimed that their lives would be at risk and they're afraid of public scrutiny and interrogation of their recollections of this event and the attacks that may follow. However, some have found the courage to speak up on behalf of many who can't. My guest today is one of them. We will call her X because she will be speaking anonymously about her experiences with Biodum Fatoyim. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you. Right, yes. Yeah. Um, I know that you, <laughs> this has been a tough process. You know, you say this has been a tough process. You've, I mean, upstairs, just going through this, there's yeah. been tears, there's been tears. Yeah. Um, even for all of us, you know, who have been in the room, yeah. it's been a, I know. A tough and we didn't even go through the experience. Yeah. But you say in 2017, yeah. you were not just a member, but a, a worker at the... A staff, actually. Staff, so you're an employee yeah. of COSA. Yes. And you say something happened between you and Beardo. Yes. Please tell me. Oh, okay. So um, at that time, I was living in a, one of the cities where the church was located because they have churches in different places. I'm sure you know that. Mm. And um, I mean, he was my boss. So I worked with him sometimes. He was in town and something um, needed to be done for church or even personally. I mean, sometimes I did, I, I, I had to do personal errands for them. Mm. So yeah, um, it wasn't like it was the first time that I was going to be at their house mm. or go do something for them personally. So that day had asked me to meet him at the house. It was a Thursday. Well, he had asked me to meet him at the house on Thursday morning. And um, I went there. It was supposed to be, you know, the usual go there, take instructions, or to either do this for church or go do that for us personally, and then go do whatever needed to be done. Um, I like to say that at this time, I considered him to not just be a mentor, but he was someone who I regarded as a father figure of mm -hmm. some sort. I mean, yeah, so <laughs> the trust was, uh, I mean, it was basically, there were, it didn't seem like any red flags to me. So I, I had gone there that morning and um, I was comfortable because I, I had, know, I know that house, that house, it wasn't the first time I was going there. So I was there, um, seated on the couch and he yeah, started to, um, address what he wanted to talk to me about. I think he started by addressing something that has to do with church. I can't particularly remember the details now, forgive me, but um, things moved pretty quickly from then to, because it was a long couch and um, I was seated on the couch and then he came and sat uh, on the couch as well. But maybe just a few, you know, there was a little space. So it wasn't like, um, he came on directly and I was allowed or anything. So, yeah, and then um, everything pretty much moved quickly from there because he started trying to pull me into a hug and then, of course, the trying to kiss me, which I found shocking. It was, um, I don't know, maybe one of the shocking, most shocking things that I've had to experience because I have known this man for such a long time. I'd known him not just as a mentor, but as a spiritual leader. I've heard him preach, I've heard him talk about, you know, God, and, and there I was about to witness what would seem like the complete opposite of everything that I thought that this person had, I mean, stood for. So yeah, um, all I can remember is saying, you can't do that, you can't do that, you have to stop. Like, I remember saying, telling him to stop like continuously while he started taking, um, while he started going at my, cause I had, I had this navy blue high waist trouser on, I can never forget, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that happened and he started to take that off and then, I mean, I remember trying to fight him off 
it was a couch. There was, I don't know, even if there was anything that I could grab, I don't know if I thought to grab anything, to be mm -hmm. honest. Maybe I was too shocked, maybe, I don't know. I remember I kept on asking him to stop and that he just kept going. And then, I mean, um, he had taken off my boards in and then my zipper was down and then my trousers was down. And then he had one hand, you know, holding me back to the couch. And then another hand, like, right up in my pants. I think at that point, I pretty much just knew what was about to happen. And um, I don't know, for someone who maybe had had to fight off a lot of, um, I'd had to fight from maybe when I was a teenager, I've, I've had to maybe fight sexual abuse on some level or the other. I mean, that's what women practically do. I just felt like I had put myself in this place. I started to feel like, okay, I'm just going to um, hope that this person, you know, remembers that they are f supposed to be my boss and my spiritual. I mean, because everything I kept saying obviously wasn't working. I kept saying, telling him to stop. I remember he kept saying, relax, just relax, just relax. If you know him, then you know that is very, um, I mean, it can be weak. Now when I think about it, I think he's a very weak person. But he also has that appearance of strength. It's like one of the things that he has going for him. So, I mean, I remember him, he, he didn't flinch. He, he, he wasn't moved. He wasn't, he obviously wasn't going to stop or anything. He just kept saying, just relax, just relax. Like, this will soon be over, just relax. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, after that, he just pretty much took off his pants and then, I mean, did what he wanted to. And, um, yeah. As soon as that was over, and he saw that I had already started crying, I mean, I had tears. I wasn't shouting or anything at this point. I was just, uh, I mean, I know that we tell people not to blame themselves, but the first thing that happens is that you blame yourself because, I mean, you brought yourself here. And so I think it was what was going on in my mind at that time. And um, when it was done, it just said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Like, he started to apologize. So he flipped from the sweet, amazing person who was my mentor to the person who I could barely recognize and then switched back to someone who cared about how I was feeling. <laughs> it was a lot, I, I mean, I didn't know what to make of it. it I, I didn't know what to make of it. But I remember that for the first time, I saw a completely different person from who we all knew or who I thought I knew. I think for, it, was, it was the first time that, um, it was the first time that I saw him as someone who just only showed you what he wanted you to see. So with him, what you see is not what you get. Why I say that is because when you meet him, or if you have any form of um, interactions with him, maybe as someone who works with him or as someone who attends the church, who you see is that charismatic leader type person who is always telling you to, you know, aim and aspire. I mean, go out and do amazing things. It's the one who is always, you know, um, trying to appear that like someone who not just understands the word but does the word. But um, the person I met that day was different. It was it was a completely different person. And even though he apologized, I think I left that place vowing to myself to never speak about it. I mean, I just felt like, oh, maybe if I don't talk about it, it will go away. Maybe if I never have to, if I never face it, then maybe it will just, you know, um, magically disappear. Maybe I won't have to deal with it. Maybe I won't have to talk about it. Maybe I won't have to think about it. So, I mean, he, after that time, of course, he went back to Nigeria because it wasn't Nigeria. I was in Nigeria at that time. He went back to Nigeria, and um, 
everything just went on like normal. I still had to work. So I still had to show up to work every day and act like everything was fine. I still had to, you know, do things for church, despite the fact that I no longer felt like I belonged there. Heck, I already started feeling like I'm not even sure if God is really who we think he is. So, um, yeah, pretty much. I'm sorry. So, what we're talking about yeah. is rape. That's what it is. I didn't go there to have sex with him. I didn't ask to have sex with him. I told him to stop on countless occasions. Yes, you told me, yes. Yes. It was not, there was no consent. Was I didn't no. give my consent. Yeah. And I feel, I, I feel like that has to be clearly yeah. stated. Yeah. I didn't give my consent. Yeah. I didn't go there to have sex with him. I didn't come on to him. As a matter of fact, I never saw him as anything other than a pastor, a mentor. Mm. Yeah, so I didn't go there to have sex with him. I didn't go there to, yeah. And you, and you, you he pinned you down, you know, as you were saying. Like, yeah. When this was and I'm sorry to go through these things or go because these are terrible experiences. But it's important for people to, I think, understand how these things happen. So first and foremost, you were in this situation where you couldn't even leave. You were in this. You were working for him. You were in the house. You were alone, yeah. and you had made it clear. You know, it, not not that it would have mattered, but you had made it clear. Stop. Yeah. And you had tried physically to get yeah. him to stop. Yeah. But he didn't stop. No, he didn't. But he just told you to relax. Yeah. He just kept saying, "Relax, relax." This was. I mean, I remember him saying, "Relax. This was over. Uh, relax." Yeah. Now let's go back a bit, okay? Because um, by this time you had been a member of the church for about nine years. Um, I'd been a member for about say eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Two thousand eight. Yes. yes. Okay. No, so I, I I became a member of the church in two thousand and nine. So that would make it seven years, I think. Seven yes. years, right? Yeah. And you say that you were just in the music, you were in the music ministry of the church. Yeah. So I mean, I joined in two thousand and nine. And a few months after, I joined in, I think it was July. And a few months after that, I joined um, the music team. There was only one music team at the time anyway. It was Avalanche. And, and this was in Abuja. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This church was in Abuja, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so um, this was the only music team at the time, Avalanche. And that's the one I was in. I joined, and I was in Avalanche up until, you know, I had to move out of Nigeria to go do some other work for mm -hmm. them someplace mm -hmm. else. Right. And you moved out to Nigeria because they offered you a job? Yes. Yes. And you had said that it was his wife who made first contact? Yes. So um, This is Modeli, his wife. Yes. yes. So when, when I joined, I was pretty much a member, just a normal member. And even when I joined the workforce, I wasn't, um, I didn't have any relationship with them. Because that was my first church, church you know. Um, it was the first time that I was make, bringing myself to try this whole organized religion thing. Prior to that time, I was in the church type. Um, by church type, I mean, I, I mean, I grew up in like a Christian home and I went to church, but I didn't have, you know, that old church thing. It was the first time I was trying it. And um, I think I stayed or I was, I found, I found it interesting because I saw a lot of young people. I saw that they were trying to do it differently, which I later realized was a deliberate thing. You know, I feel like um, it's really important to say that everything that is done in that place is really deliberate. They're very deliberate from how they make you see the excellence, the attention to detail. Yeah, maybe not so excellent, but you know what I mean. Yeah, and then the attention to detail. Everything builds you up to create some kind of psyche in you as someone who is visiting either for the first time or as a member. So an average person there thinks in a certain way, yes. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd been in that church for maybe like four, almost five, like almost five years. And I didn't have any personal relationship with them. I mean, they knew, they, uh, they were aware of me because of course I was in the music group. So, and they, at least if there's anybody that passed us, they know people in music group. Yeah, so, um, 
But sometime in 2015 was when I started to, I mean, get that old um, feeling of being brought close. And it was from um, his, from his wife, Modeli, yeah. So she would send, she would have someone call me to come over to the house to maybe do something for her. She would um, maybe have some women's program that he needed, they wanted to do, and she would say, oh, I need you to, um, and do this program, I need you to, you know. Um, and then he moved from that to um, me helping them take care of their son, the last one, Ephraim. So I would take him out. She would just, you know, have me take him out on Sunday evenings. Sometimes we'll just go to some place in Abuja, just um, take him hang out and then take him back home. So that's how we started. Now, if you know them, you would also know that they don't they they are very controlled about who they allow access to their kids they actually do not allow people access their kids so even as a member you don't have access to their kids yeah so um so, so, so yeah. if you had access to their kids if they had access to the family they wanted you to come in yeah i needed to say that because i needed to let you see how deliberate every single decision or every single thing so when they bring you close, there's always a reason why. If they bring you in, it's because they brought you in. It's not because there was something that you had to do. Yeah, so um, I quickly went from that to tutoring the other kids. Yeah. She knew that I was, I mean, good with them. She knew that I had, I mean, I, I liked to hang around them. She knew that I was good with them, so yeah. I would, I would go to the house to tell them, I would take them out, hang out, and yeah, so pretty much that was how it all started until she made me an offer to go to some other country where they were going to be in school at. So they were schooling, you know, somewhere outside Nigeria. And so at this time you had been working with them for how long now? So I had not started working with them. So we were just helping them. Yeah. This seems like a very familiar pattern because oh. I've heard this. Before. from all the stories that we've encountered okay. you know um so he so you had been helping them yes. domestically yes. for how long um so they offered to go to to travel mm -hmm. with for the kids came in 2016 so i had been involved with them maybe for like an entire year an entire year yes. and then they made you an offer for a job in another country yeah so tell us about yes that. so yes and um, so that, I think I think that's another thing. They they bring you close enough to see what your interest what your interests are, what the things that matter to you are. I think in my case, um, the kids were like a motivation to get me to take that job. And I think that she sort of knew because she knew how important they were to me. And it's pretty simple. I think it's the fact that I believed in their vision at that time. I also believed that they were onto something that was, you know, revolutionary. So I was sold out on it, on that vision, which is, I mean, whatever it is, I can't remember. Yeah, so um, caring for their kids felt to me like caring for them. I did it because it was just something that felt like, you know, um, it felt like something that I was doing for myself. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. So um, she made me that offer and said, oh, so yeah, we know that you want to do other things. And I mean, she knew that I wanted to do other things at the time, and she knew that I could do those are the things anyway outside here. So she said, oh, since you wanted to do other things anyway, and you can pretty much do it from there, why don't you just go help us, I mean, be there, since we cannot, we can't be there and be here at the same time, so why don't you go with them and then help us um, with them, be there, at least their legal guardian while we're not there. So, yeah, that's how, so I took the job, I went and to. that's how I moved, to, yes. Something strikes me. You talk about Modele and Biodun as they. It's one unit. Yeah. So, um, it, the naive me, like um, some four 
maybe even three years ago, or maybe even maybe say two years ago, would not re would refer to them as they in this sense. Because I would think, oh, maybe she's not in on these things, or maybe she's not, she doesn't know, or, but I think that I have had a lot of personal encounters with them both, enough to know that they kind of are a unit. I don't think that she's unaware. I don't think she's unaware. As, as a matter of fact, I'm willing to bet money on the fact that she's not unaware. Mm. She's, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that she was the one who pulled me in. Of course, it took me a lot of time to realize that all, all that time it was grooming. I didn't know that that's what it was. I wish I knew that that was what it was. I mean, I'm not even proud to say that that's what it was, but it, that's what it was, yeah. But she is the one who made that happen. Because if that came from him, it would probably have raised maybe a more red flag earlier on than it would have if it came from her. And um, I think there's a pattern there. If you ask me, I think there's a pattern there. Because I think it's easier for me as a woman to feel more comfortable if you, as another woman, grant me access to your home. Yeah, because I also think that um, the idea to use you know, the kids to use being a part of like, you know, their person being, um, having access to their personal space and their kids was also a deliberate attempt because nothing says, I trust you. Like, you can watch my kids. Mm. I mean, mm. if I can't watch your kids, then you must really trust me. <laughs> and what that says also is, I trust that you trust me. So I kind of like, um, even give you trust without thinking that you need to earn it. It's, it just naturally happens because, I mean, it's, there's nothing that says, oh, I feel comfortable with you. I feel like I'm safe with you. They, like I said, they do not give anyone access to their kids. They don't give anyone access to their kids. So I think that the mind, the, the subtle, you know, mind game is, Sometimes it's subtle, but it's all there, like the deliberacy, just making sure that everything that you're surrounded with speaks to you in a way that they probably don't have to verbalize. Yeah, so. And so, um, and what's remarkable about this is I did have a, a conversation with another survivor, okay. um, Busola Dakolo. Okay. And what's striking for me, and this is not even objective, this qualitatively, I do remember, you know, um, how affectionately she spoke about Shindara, yeah. who is, the, I think, their first child. I think they are amazing. Yes. And, you know, and I'm sorry, to, I'm, I apologize to Shindara that because they, they, brought their, they brought the kids into this story, yeah. you know, so, but then I remember she would speak, even up until that moment, she would speak about these kids with affection. I'll tell you that one of the hardest things that I have to do at this interview is talk about those kids. Yeah. Yeah. And that's bearing in mind what I've had to go through. So even after what you've had to go through, yeah. you're still thinking about these kids. Yeah, because I don't think that anyone deserves to have to be introduced to something like this when you didn't ask for it. Yeah. I'm yeah. So, and I mean, I'm not surprised that, you know, she would talk about Shindara with such affection. Mm. I'm not, she's, I mean, they are amazing. Their kids are amazing. That's, I mean, that's what I would say. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so when, um, so when, so it's, this, so the second part of it is for me that, Apart from the kids part of it, it's also the idea that also when Busola spoke with me, Busola mentioned that that same pattern of inviting young women okay. in the church to come, and this was in Elori, not Abuja, yeah. and this was at the beginning of the church, yeah. to come over to the house yeah. and help with stuff. It's yeah. chillingly similar. Okay. And Busola wasn't certain because again at this time this was she was 16 yeah. or 17 yeah if 
Modeli knew or didn't know. Okay. But she said, you know, I think she had to have known because yeah. she invited me to the house to yeah. help. Yeah. You know, he came to demand that I come sleep in the other room. And so it's chilling how similar this is. Yeah. Based on what you are saying, this must have happened to other girls, <sighs> other women, girls, women, you know, because Busola was a, a, a child at the yeah, time, but you were an adult, but exactly. it's the same pattern. Yeah. Did you know of other people that this, did you hear? Okay, so um, the first time that I ever heard anything about him was Essie Walter. I mean, we all heard it about Essie Walter. And I remember that morning because I, I had woken up and I was going to dress up for work and I picked my phone and I saw it. And the first thing that came to my head was, oh my God, oh my God, what is this? Like, I was just uh, shocked. I was trying to understand what was going on. And I remember that I shut it down, like, maybe like 30 minutes after. Like, I tried to understand it, and it didn't make any sense to me at the time. I was like, no, that's not possible. No, that's not possible. This just has to be one of those things. I don't know why this person is doing this, but yeah. So, um, that was the first time that that happened. And of course, we all were aware of how that situation was handled. Then, at the time when Essie's um, case came up, I had not started working with them full time. I was just a member who was a worker. So, I mean, I still had my day job, and then I would go to church there. But I think that an average, this is a good time to say that an average COSA member is, an average COSA member adores beautiful Fatoimbo. That place gives you a false um, sense of superiority. They mm. pump you up to feel like you're not like everybody else. And even though, of course, you're not like everybody else, but in the sense, not in that sense, but in the sense of, you know, we are, there's a lot of undertones that help you build that form of confidence in this is a tribe. And it is us, you know, it is us and everybody else is just trying to get us. So even though nobody's trying to tell you that, oh, they're trying to get us, you just start to get that idea from, you know, the things that are said, from the things that are done. Sometimes, on an av in an average service, you probably said you break your mother and you said break God. Yeah. You probably, there's probably more celebration for him than there is for God because at every point you're celebrating. <laughs> yeah, so it's only a matter of time before you do that, before someone's image rises up in a way that you don't even have to deliberately command it. It just happens. You go there every day, you go there every other day, or like two, twice a week as a member. But as a worker, you go there almost every day, which is why you find out that people are quick to jump to their defense. People are quick to, you know, say anything. People are quick to fight. They are quick to, you know, mm -hmm. just do anything because of how much, you know. It's an us versus them. Thank you. Kind of, yes. Thank you. It's, that place also isolates you. Like, it shuts you out. It shuts you in. It, it gives you that feeling like the world, I don't need the world. All I need is these people, this tribe of people. Yeah, so it's really subtle. When you're in it, you don't even know. Yeah. So imagine 3,000 people, or I don't know how many they are right now, but imagine 3,000 people feeding off each other, being friends with each other on social media, because that's what happens. You're all friends. You follow each other on social media. You do business with each other. You, it's only a matter of time before you start to recycle the same thing, thought process. It, it's only a matter of time before you all start to think alike. So I think that also helps with the us versus them. Yeah. This is very scary. Because what you are describing... It's a cult. Yeah, I know. I know. Unfortunately, I mean, um, yes. Yes. That's exactly what I'm describing. That's exactly what I'm describing. Okay, so... Um, and if you are, what you are describing is true, then these members, some of whom were your former friends and your former, yeah. you know, colleagues, yeah. they will hate you for doing this. Okay, so, um, yeah. I'm pretty sure I have people who hate me already. Mm. I'm sure. Um, I think really, 
there's, there's really nothing that you can do sometimes about these kind of things. I hate that I've had to let people go. I hate that I've had to lose, you know, some people who at some point in my life were amazing people. And I had, I mean, great relationships with. But the truth is, when you're on the inside, it's different from when you're looking from the outside in. There are a lot of things I see differently now because I've had time to be on the out and I see for what it really is. But again, when you're in there, it's like drinking some form of Kool-Aid, right? We're all mad people to them. They think we're really mad. Like, what is wrong with Who is you guys? we? That's the general public. Yeah, right now. Because I remember the way they see the general public. It's like yeah. you guys are mad. No, like I'm talking about right now. Right, right. Yeah, right, we right, everything right. going on. Right, right. Yes. Right. They're like... Right. Yeah. So like when the, when the crisis hits, when they yes, when it crisis about eats, their pastor, their... When it crisis hits, their standard go-to mode is what is wrong with people? Why can't they just let us be great? Because... Biodo tells them God is about to do something and the devil knows and the devil doesn't want it to happen. Yes, and this happens every time. So with Ese Water, it was because, oh, we wanted to move into this big auditorium and the devil didn't want us to move in. So Ese Water had to come and we did, there will always be something. There will always be something the devil is trying to stop. There will always be something that, and unfortunately, that sells because, I mean, it's religion. Yeah. Okay, um, so this incident happens yeah. in, in this other country, in his apartment. Yes. And when he finishes, what happens? What does he say to you? What does he, he do? He says, he's sorry, he didn't mean to hurt me. It was, I mean, he, he just apologized. I mean, he kept apologizing, said how sorry he was. I was honestly more interested in just getting the hell out of there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was it. Okay. And that was it. After that time, I still had to work with him. I still had to work because, I mean, it was work. And especially when you keep this kind of thing to yourself, if you don't tell anyone, it means you can't act anyhow. You have to find a way to still act like life is normal, even if it's not. So you still go about, around doing, you know, whatever it is that you do normally. So it took, it, took, um, it took a while, mm. it took a while. I mean, that happened, um, I think, at the, in the last quarter of 2017, September, I think it was, September, yeah. And um, I still stayed till July of the year after, which is, uh, so I think it kind of helped that I was in, in Nigeria and I didn't have to see him or have anything mm. to do with him personally. Um, but all that time, I, there was a, I already had a disconnect. I wasn't, I was present, but I wasn't mentally present. So I was just there more out of, oh, this is what I committed to. This is what everybody expects me to be doing at this time. And yeah, so, yes. Uh, it's something I want to push in. It's something I want to push in to, which is abuse of power okay. as separate from rape, because there are two things happening here. Yeah. And it's also something because I don't think that men understand this. You know, okay. I certainly didn't understand it until many years ago. I think he definitely understands it. Right? You think he? I'm not even saying. I'm saying that people, people who are listening to this story, oh, okay. Okay. need to understand. And, and as, a, and as a, a, a person who is, who has power myself, yeah. and just going back and looking at past things, okay. I think people need to have the compassion and empathy to understand what happens to a victim of this. Okay. That if a person, if this happens, and this, you, are, you are almost caged yeah. because you are his employee, yeah. he's your spiritual father, Exactly. you're stuck in another country. That was the hardest part. What? That was the hardest part. That was the hardest part because yeah. you were away from your family. Yes. And so, even if there wasn't a rape, this was an incredibly agonizing space to be to in. To be in, yeah. Yeah. And 
Yes, so because that is important. I think that that's an important thing for all of us who have ever exercised power over anybody else yeah. to think about the kind of pain that we put them through so, yeah. and what we may owe them, you know. And so he apologizes to you, yeah. but you still have to go through this mental torture. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's that. I want to go back. But you, in this particular case, there's, there's unconscious wielding of power. Yeah. But something you said, now you said in this yeah. case, Modele and the other knew what they were doing. They yeah. knew that they were wielding power. Yeah. Um, so if there's anything that those people are, is aware of how much power they have. I think that it's important to note in this conversation that if you're looking for people who are unaware of the power they have, Biodo and Modeli are not the people that you're looking for. Mm. Yeah. They are aware. They're aware. They know how much how, how much people adore them. They know how important they are to people. They know how weighty their words are. Yes. And I think they exploit that. Right. Yes. I think they feed on it. I think they channel it and use it. Mm. Yes. I think so. It does. So sometimes, of course, because before I, um, when I was introduced to this, this alleged racket, okay. there are so many stories yeah. of so many people. Yeah. So many. Yeah. But then we only ever in public heard Essie Walter's story, exactly. which was even just, uh, which was centered on adultery. Exactly. And then this year, you know, because of Timmy Dakolo's outburst yeah. a few months ago, if this has been happening for so long to so many people in so many ways for 20 years, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and people, people have been afraid to speak out, then it makes sense what you are saying, that yeah. they have created an atmosphere of insecurity yeah. that stops people from speaking out. Yeah, and I think it's also that thing where there's a culture of silence in church. There's, um, I mean, we all want to appear a certain way. Nobody wants to appear out of line, right? There's a lot of judgment that goes on in there, even though it's supposed to be the safest place. But it's not a safe place. It's not safe. I mean, it's supposed to be safe, but it's not. Um, so how do I walk up to you and say, oh, guess what, yesterday, Story to me. How do you even begin to form that conversation? I had friends in that system who I didn't say anything to about this until just a couple of months ago. And the reason why I eventually told them, two reasons actually, was because I was done feeling like that was something that I did to myself because I didn't do that to myself. I was done feeling like I did something wrong by trusting someone, by serving them with, if, I mean, I served there. I did it like collaterally. And it's not even something that is eating. An average Koza person who was there when I was there would tell you that this was like one of these people's major people, right? So I'm, I'm not just some girl who, you know, would come whenever she would come to church, whenever she felt like, and then not come. I was a committed person. I didn't feel like I deserved that. That's one. Two, I also felt like, you know, it wasn't going to go away. Every other day, I saw something on social media that would remind me. So the anxiety attacks, everything. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and it would be an amazing day. I would be ready to take it on and just do stuff. And next thing I know, to me, Dakolo is trending on Twitter and people are coming up with all kinds of takes and I'm back exactly where I started. Yeah, so I think all of that finally made me realize that this isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, if there was anything I needed to do was to speak to the people that I, f I believed cared about me, about it. So I, I called my friends for the first time, like three months ago. I said, you guys, I need to tell you something. It was a conference call, because I couldn't bear to do it one after the other. So I put, them on a, I put them on a conference call and I said, so this happened. And this is how it happened. And this is where it happened. Yeah, so um, it took me a lot of, I don't know, courage to do that but I could also only do that with my friends because I trusted that the I mean because of our history and how much we had 
been through together, I trusted that, you know, they would be able to um, be there for me on days that I could not be there for myself. Yeah. But now talk about an average person. Come to talk about it. Um, like I'm doing this anonymously. That's telling. <laughs> I mean, I want to be the girl who is bold and, you know, just say, oh, you know, guess, just put my face on. Yeah, but there's just so much that you have to contend with. You have to contend with people doubting your story, people asking you questions, people even questioning the validity of the story that you have. You also have to deal with church folk who would rather believe a pastor who cannot, you know, keep it in pants than a church member. They would rather believe him. It's just blissful ignorance. It's, sa it's safer that way. It's easier. Because then they don't have to question anything else. Nobody wants to question anything. Nobody wants to question anything. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to believe that everything you believed or that someone that you've is a lie or it has been. So you rather just lie to yourself. You rather just look the other way than believe something that makes you question. So yeah, I think it's, it's all of that that makes it really hard for people. There are a lot of people, I'm sure. And how I'm sure is initially, I, you know, I, when it happened to me, I felt like, oh, this was just a me thing. And then um, I saw Timmy's post and then I made a connection and I'm like, okay, so wait, this is not a me thing. This is a normal thing for him. But this is not even just with adults. This is with teenagers as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was already like a, okay, what is going on here? And then, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good that you mentioned um, um, Timmy's post and all of that, because I think that's the, when you, as you tell it, that was the first time you ever heard from Biodun himself yes. about something with Timmy's wife, Busola. Yeah, so I'll tell you what. Um, in early 2018, I think it was Timmy, I didn't even follow him on Instagram at the time. And um, apparently he had gone and made a post about some Abu Jafar stuff that everybody had respect for, but was so abusing teenage girls. No, this was in 2018, I think. 2018, early 2018, 2018, 2018 yeah. Yes. So um, apparently Timmy had made a post and he, was, he had said something about an Abuja pastor who everybody, I mean, who, you know, people looked up to but was abusing young girls. I didn't, I had not seen that post because I don't follow him on Instagram. I, I didn't follow him at the time. I do now. Um, and um, my friend called me and said, hey, what's up? I was like, oh, I'm good. She called me from Nigeria. And um, she said, oh, what's, what, what's going on? I said, um, I don't get it. She said, oh, because... Um, Pastor has been trying to get your number. He just called me to ask for your number. So I was like, oh, okay. I, have, I didn't tell her anything about what happened. So this is her still assuming that everything was fine and he was my boss and, you know, so. She just said, oh, he was just asking me um, about you and saying, oh, he, he doesn't have your number anymore and he asked me to send, you, send him your number. So I just sent it to him. And then maybe like five, 10 minutes after that, he calls me. I think he called from Colorado or something. It was in some country in America. I think Colorado it was. Because my phone has that thing where, you know, someone calls you and you don't have the number, but it shows. Yeah, so um, as soon as I picked up, he said, hi. I was like, who is this? And he said, this is Pastor Bader. I was like, oh, OK. Good afternoon, sir. And he said, um, how are you? I said, I'm fine. And he said, I know you're angry with me. So for me, that was shocking. I'm like, OK. Like, you don't call someone randomly out of the blue and say, I know you're angry with me. One, you're my boss. And if there's anything is, I'd spent months, you know, without any form of communication. So I knew that there had to be a reason he was calling. And he said, he started to apologize all over again, which was weird. That way he was, he just wanted to say sorry. He knows that, you know, um, he knows that he, what, what he did was really bad. He just wanted to say that he was really sorry and that um, he wanted me to know that um, whatever his actions had been or whatever his actions were, his heart was, I don't know, those were his exact words. I don't know how to put but yeah, but that, oh, I just want you to know my heart. Those were his exact words. I just want you to know my heart. I'm really sorry, you know, yada, yada, yada. We went from that conversation because I just, 
kept saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then we went from that conversation to something about work, which was oh, so how is, how, is, um, how is this going, how is that going? So we wrapped it up on work. That conversation, we wrapped it up on work, yeah. But as soon as the call, um, as soon as that call was over, I heard about the whole old team had gone online. A couple of my friends from Nigeria had called me and said, oh, you're, yeah, so I started to tie it together and I was like, oh, okay, so he calls me because he's trying to, like, just take care of loose ends. So you know how you feel like, oh, um, something's about to happen and you're just tidying up. That's what I felt like. So I, of course I knew that was what it was, but again, I was a girl who had not told anyone who had not even started to deal with it by herself. So I just filed it under do not deal. <laughs> yeah, like everything else. So yeah, but for me, it was telling and it made me realize that this person is someone that you want to go as far away from. This place is not where you want to be. You want to get as far away from here. And I mean, I'd already started you know, working on my exit strategy from the beginning of that year. I knew I was going to leave. I knew exactly when I wanted to leave. As a matter of fact, I mean, I knew I had a plan to leave. It, it, was, it was just that I couldn't just up and leave because my life had been tied there for the past seven years. I mean, and then out of that seven years, I had tied full time, like almost two years or something to it, to that place. So I needed to get myself together. I needed to know where I wanted to go from there. I needed to know what I wanted to do. So I took all that time to do that. So um, yeah. So. After that conversation, he and I had no contact or whatever until I, I had given myself a date that I wanted to leave and I sent a message. Because I mean, it's still my boss after all. I still have to exit the right way. I can just up and leave. I wish I, I did. Sometimes when I think about it, I'm like, why didn't you just pack it back and leave? Why did you feel like you needed to tell anybody? Yeah, but I did that. I don't know why, but I did. So I sent a message and said, um, I just want to, I need to speak to you. It was an Instagram DM. So I sent him a DM on Instagram and said, I need to speak to you about something work related. So he calls, he calls me back and says, oh, um, I, I got your message. And of course, the first thing he says is, is anybody around you? I'm like, no. He said, okay. Because nobody can know I'm calling you. Those were his words. So um, I went straight to the point, which is I'm ready to go. I, this has been good, but I need to go, so I'm going to go. I just wanted to give you a heads up. I feel like, you know, this is still work after all, so. And he asked that I give him time, that he wanted to tell, um, he wanted to tell, um, what's her name now? He wanted to tell um, his wife himself, that he wanted to tell, because I mean, they, they were both my bosses, and she was the one who brought me on anyway. So I felt like, oh, okay. So he asked what time I wanted to leave, and I told him. Anyway, um, after, that, after that, I came to Nigeria, I think the month after, and he asked for a meeting. He asked me to, he told, someone called me from church, someone who works closely with him in church called me and said, oh, um, pastor asked to see you um, at 12 or whatever. So yeah, I went there and met him at the basement. He was alone. It wasn't alone. Someone who assists them, like a, you know, like someone who helps them around do stuff, was there, but in the other room. I met him on my way in, but he was alone in that room. So I mean, you know, seated area. It was seated right. I mean, on the couch across. I sat across, and um, the first thing he said, because I had my phone with me, the first thing he said was, "Put your phone away." So classic behavior, he, he doesn't like phones. Even with those of us who work with him, like it's not really the kind of person who you're working with and you're on your phone, I don't know, for some, for some reason. So I, I mean, I sat down and then he started to apologize all over again. At this time, he already knew I was leaving. So he started to apologize all over again and talk about how he, could, you know, he was up the entire night, you know, just thinking about how much he had wronged me and he just wanted me to know that he was sorry. So there he was, crying, and I was wondering why. Because, um, yeah, so, I mean, he kept going on and on about how um, things had been tough. Now, at this time, um, Timmy had made that post, and that, it looked like that thing wasn't going away, because I think he stayed for some time. They kept having, I don't know, I, from what I heard, they kept having that old back and forth thing where they were trying to get people to talk to Timmy behind, I don't know. Yeah, so we started to talk about how, yeah, they, 
they, he, he knows that he's not a perfect person, but he didn't rape Busola. Now, before that time, I'd, I didn't have it. I mean, I know that Tim, I know Timmy Dakolo. I don't know him personally, but I know him. And then I know his wife because she's Timmy Dakolo's wife. Yeah, so I don't know them. I don't know them personally. I'd also never heard anything about her until, up until that day. So it brings her up. I mean, out of the blue, went from apologizing to me about how he feels like he has wronged me and everything that, you know, had happened. He just wanted me to know he was really sorry. And um, he said, um, they're saying that he raped Timmy Dakulu's wife, but that he didn't do that. That he knew her when they were in the learning. He wasn't even married then, I think he said. And that she just, she just was some girl who used to come around him a lot, you know. He painted as fast because he, I think his exact words were, you know, those um, girls that were very grown at that time, like she came around me a lot and something happened. And then people, um, he, so he painted it as we had a thing. She liked me and then I liked her back. So imagine my shock when I see that statement on just a couple of days ago. And on that statement, I'm saying, um, I've never wrote anyone in my life, which was like the most ridiculous thing, because that's a bloody lie. And I didn't know Busala except in the capacity of a pastor. And I'm like, isn't this the same person who told me she was coming on to him? So why didn't this appear? So yeah, for me, that, that seemed like, because, so that means you've already told two different stories in, in this case. As regards, I don't know what other story is out there, but the story that I was told by him, which I didn't ask for because I, I had no business knowing. I mean, I just wanted to move the hell on with my life. I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't need to hear that. Yeah. So he brought it up himself. He was the one who brought Busola up. And I think that that was an attempt at emotional blackmail, which is another thing he's really good at. So he sees that he's already about to lose on one end. He switches to the other end. He does it with church as well. He did it with the whole S.A. Walter thing. He appeals to your emotions. He finds a common ground. So if the common ground is, oh, um, this person has known me for a long time, because he kept saying, you've known us for a long time, you've served us, you don't deserve this, um, you've watched my children, you've loved them as your own. Now that was him trying to find you know, something that we could both agree on and I could be sympathetic with, yeah. I also think he brought Busola up because he felt like maybe I was going to start tying, tying the incidents together and start putting it together. So if there's anything he does, he's, 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 a, he's like, um, very good at studying you and seeing how your mind works so that he knows exactly how to you know, act or where to place you or whatever. Yeah, so maybe somehow he must have known that, oh, if she feels that, you know, this is not just a her thing, then maybe it's, this will mean more to her and then she would not look the other way. So maybe that was his attempt at trying to get me to see him not as, you know, someone who lives like this on a normal day. Maybe one of them is to just say, oh, you're just the exception in my horrible mistake or whatever. So yeah, he did that, you know, brought her up and said how oh, that, you know, they knew each other, she came around him. And he wasn't trying to, I mean, he wasn't trying to do anything. He didn't even know that she was that young and that, you know, something happened. Yeah, so basically that, that's, that, that's pretty much how that conversation went that day. Um, I, I left that room after, you know, after I had apologized and said he was sorry and that um, he, he knows that I don't deserve it. I mean, he just pulled a lot of emotional cards, emotional cards. Um, the only thing that was important to me in that moment was getting out of that place. There, there are so many things that when I go over that conversation that I feel like I would do now, but I think I wasn't able to do back then because the only thing that I had my eyes on was get out. Like I, I just wanted to get out, so yes. So that was more important to me than anything else, maybe than recording the conversation. That didn't even cross my mind. It should have, but it didn't. Yeah, so um, maybe recording the conversation, maybe I mean, calling him out on his BS, maybe, I don't know. But I, I just wanted to get out of there, yeah, so. And I needed to make it look as seamless as possible because it's a large organization and people talk. 
and I think that it's all still part of the whole culture of silence. So you want to have, appear like you have it all together and live peacefully at your own. I mean, I was willing to sacrifice myself. I was willing to be the girl who just left peacefully. I didn't want to make any drama or any trouble. I didn't want to make anything about me. I just wanted to go in peace. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it's a large organization and, and you know, people talk and you don't want people to start asking you, so why are you leaving? So did something happen? I mean, yeah, so those were the things on my mind at that point, yes, so. And so, so you wanted to live as peacefully as, yeah, as possible, yeah. so you just did this. Yeah. Uh, but you'd mentioned something about him asking you if there was um, anything you wanted. Oh, yeah. Um, so on the, the last time, I, I mean, the last time I saw him right before I left, you know, after having that brief conversation, he, he was, I mean, I was about to go. And then he says, is there anything you want me to do for you? Obviously, I knew he meant like financially, yeah, because I mean, that was the tone. Well, what else would he be asking for? Yeah, so I looked at him and I said, no, I'm fine, thank you. And he said, let me know if you change your mind. And I said, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, so that was it, yeah. Okay, um, so to recap, okay. just to be sure we had the facts of all of this, of this allegation, okay. you were invited into the Fatou Imbo family by Modele Biodon's wife to yes. come and work for them. Yes. Then after that, you were offered a job. Yes. And then you were raped yes. by Biodon. Yes, absolutely. And um, you are, you can bet on it that Modele, his wife, knew about this, this, that Biodon had, even if not raped you, had had uh, uh, sexual relations with you? Yes, because yes. I, I think that for someone who has such a unique pattern, mm. I find it really hard to believe that she's unaware. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the same things keep coming up, if the same things keep reoccurring, if someone has such a big issue being around women, then you would think that the person who is like the number one person in their lives would try to help them by at least reducing the number of women that they bring into their lives, right? I mean, that's just like... Uh, at the least, she knew that this man was having affair or sexual relations yes, with I, 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 young women. I definitely women. believe it. Right. I definitely believe right. it. With young women yes. who considered him to be their spiritual father. I definitely She's believe that. That one said to I, did, I definitely believe, believe that. that. Yes. Right. Um, and so this was, you said you were in the church. I just want to reestablish kind of the yeah. order for people who are watching and the many Nigerians and other people yeah. who may not understand what rape is and how it happens yeah. and may put all the burden of, on, the, on the woman, yeah. which is why many women who have told us these stories haven't, won, haven't come out. Yeah. So this was, the, 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 you, you joined the church in 2009. Yeah. You were invited to work for him in 2015, you, the, 2016, yeah. 2016. Yeah. you left the church in 2018. 2018. The yeah. rape happened in 2017, yeah. right. Um, now, I know, because there's also a pattern, and you mentioned this, and that's why I'm asking, that pastors know that this is happening. Of course. At the least, they know that there are allegations of rape. I think I that a couple of them knows that they are, these things are more than allegations. Right. As a matter of fact, um, in the last couple of days, I've seen, you know, random people talk about how oh, they've always known in Ilorin, for example, mm -hmm. and how, you know, even back then, it wasn't such a hidden thing. I've also heard people say, oh, he didn't come to Abuja because God asked him to come to Abuja. He came to Abuja because he was running from something in learning, right? So if someone has such an history, and they've done it for that long, and they've made friends along the way, there's only two things that make sense. That they have friends who are that way, who they are comfortable with, or they have friends who at least know but are choosing to look the other way because touch not my anointed or whatever else that's we say about these things. Yes, so I believe that people are aware. I know for a fact that some of his mentors are aware, right? 
I know that some of his mentors are aware. They are aware of... I mean, he worked in his office, he lived in his house, he invited him, so you know, you, you know what you're saying. Exactly. So I know that some of his mentors know about, I mean, his patterns, these things. But I mean, if you... If you go to, you know, if you go an, that extra mile to do something for your mentor, if you have a mentor and all you do is lavish, just lavish them, right? With gifts and... You're talking about Biodun doing this to this, his mentors? Yeah. Who are seniors in the They have faith. this Koza 12. That's what they call them. Koza 12? Right. Yes. And Koza 12 is basically like a bunch of people who are supposed to be his mentors, right? So... Are they pastors? Yeah. All pastors right. from Nigeria, from outside Nigeria. Right. Yeah, so they just have like this group of people who, according to them, pray for him, put his picture up in their prayer rooms. Yeah, because that's more effective, I guess. We're not accusing anybody of anything. But it makes sense that if these are prominent Nigerian pastors, it makes yeah. sense that they are, haven't spoken out against him or asked him to step down properly from the church when people make accusations. Because some of the things I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> Even in the realm of allegation, it's, would make, it make you people's mentors say, say you know, down. step down. So the thing about Koza is also that they're not really accountable to anyone, even though they say they are accountable to people. Is there they a board? Not. So there are no elders in Koza, you know that. Right. There are no elders. You know how you walk into church, elder, yes. elder. There are no elders in Koza. There are no deacons or deaconesses either. So what you have in Koza is the senior pastor, the assistant senior pastor, I think they call her. I can't remember. I've made a lot of deliberate effort to forget a lot of things from about that place. Yeah, so um, then there's those ministers. And ministers are pretty much, it's like me saying, my boys. Mm. But of course, let's call them ministers because mm. That's what we are for the sake of this conversation. Mm. So basically what they really do is go upstage when daddy and mommy says go upstage mm. and then sit their asses down when daddy and mommy says sit down. So yeah, that's, that's in-house. Yeah. That's what is obtainable. So in-house, in Koza, there is no one institutionally nah. to hold Biodu accountable. Nope. Nobody. No. Right. No. Right. Um, no, if trust people exist, we haven't. Well, it, I didn't meet them when I was. But you were working. You worked yeah. there for for two years, three years, four years, five years. Uh, so we can't. I mean, I was there for from 2009 to 2018. Yes, so, so I mean, if those people exist, I would. You know. would have known about them. Yes. But you know about the twelve. I know about the twelve because like, I mean, everybody knows about twelve. Right. If you are a Koza member, you know yes. about. It's 12. like an informal group of mentors. Exactly. But so I, not not even informal. Like he says, oh, these are our mentors. Oh, so he says, oh, he says this. This is like a thing. Oh yeah. Oh, the Koza twelve is like a thing. Oh, it's a it's a bloody thing. <laughs> right. Yes. And so and people in the church know who these twelve are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody right. does. And but they've not taken any action, as these things have been have been happening. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, for example, when, when pe these people are, are going to come for any program, it goes over and beyond. Mm. And then, of course, to justify why he would do that, he would say, oh, you know, we're going to have a so person in the house today, and mm. we have done this and that and that. You know me, I'm a grace collector. He says that around. Mm. He says, oh, you know I'm a grace collector, because that grace collector is supposed to let us know that he is conscious of the grace that these people carry, and that he's making deliberate attempts to, to tap, tap into, into that it. grace. Yeah, so, yeah. yes. So, I mean, that's where the whole grace collector comes from. So sometimes, I mean, it's even something that, you know, everybody just, oh, grace collector, you know. Sometimes it sits it and everybody finishes it. That happens a lot as well. Yeah, so, yeah. So I, I, I don't know how effective or how efficient people like that can be in terms of control mm. and um, checks and balances because is they can see even though they are older even though they've done probably done a lot of more things in ministry they also consider him to be revolutionary they consider him to be doing something different they consider they talk about him with so much regard they talk about him with so even like in front of everybody so people like that add a lot of lavish gifts and money and all of that to that mix and I don't see how you can effectively call someone on anything that they do. I mean, maybe you call mm. them in private, but mm. 
calling them enough to actually do something about mm. it. I don't know if. Wow. So, yeah. Um, this alleged rape. Why did you want to report? <laughs> okay. To. This is because I've worked with people who have dealt with trauma. I know. Yeah. That is a stupid question, yeah. but I will ask it anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Why did you not report to the police, okay. to the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria, to the Christian Association of Nigeria, okay. to the media, to your parents, to... <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I'm really sorry because I see people ask these questions. Yeah. They ask it on social media, they ask it on Twitter, they ask why haven't you reported to the association of people working on the road, you know, about this. And I see them yeah. asking. So on behalf of all this, Question. it doesn't make sense, people. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't add up. Yeah. Mathematicians, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, calculating. Yeah. On behalf of all of them, yeah. I'm asking you, okay. why didn't you report to other people? Okay, so... Um for me, it's simple. I think it's survival was more important to me than anything else. Um, everybody has a coping mechanism. Everybody does. I have mine. People have. People have. Whatever it is that works for you. Yeah. So like I said earlier, even I wasn't ready to admit to myself that I had been raped because that would make me a victim. That would mean that I had spent all this time in my life trying to get away from rape only to end up walking right into it. I don't know if you get what I mean. So for me, it was about survival. I wasn't thinking about, um, I wasn't thinking about the police. I'm not going to lie. The, the police was like the last thing on my mind. I was in a terrible place and I just needed to deal. Now, aside from that, when you start to now, you know, pull your thoughts together and assess what just happened to you and everything that has happened, what you do is, switch into some sort of survival mode. So if you have maybe, for example, a family friend that you trust, you call them, and then you cry to them, and then they take you to the clinic or whatever. In my case, I was in a strange, I mean, I was in a foreign country. I was in a country that I didn't have family in, even though I had some people that, you know, um, I considered to be friends. But I also did not consider them to be those kind of friends that I could go to and say, oh, do you understand? Because they were my work friends. They were people that I met, like, you know, just from staying in this. I didn't know them from anywhere. So to, to come out to people who are basically like almost strangers to you and talk about something as horrible as that's happening to you and have to, you know, admit that you feel yourself is something that nobody jumps to doing. It's something that I, I wasn't going to jump to do. Yeah, so um, I, didn't, I, I, I wasn't um, thinking about making a point or you know, trying to get help. There's also that part where you ask yourself, so who is going to believe you? Like, who is going to believe you? I mean, it crosses your mind. Like, OK, so I'm, I say something. Let's say I say something now. Who is going to believe me? Who is going to listen and believe me? Especially when you know who this person is, you know how much influence they have on people. You know how much people adore them. Who is going to believe you? Chances are people would rather say, I was the one who came on to him. I mean, there's a 99% chance that that's going to be, you know, the easiest conclusion that for people to actually believe whatever I say. And that's even me considering the fact that um, I don't think, oh, that I have... I have any history of, you know, anything in all my years in that church to give people the impression that, you know, I could have just made it up. But still, like I said before, it's always going to be about blissful ignorance for these people. These people don't even want to consider the fact that the person who they hold in their highest regard will do something as shitty as this. So they would rather not believe you. They would rather, because it means they have to question everything else. And nobody wants to question everything else. So they would rather not believe you. So maybe because I was an insider and I knew how, I mean, how that place works, it, wasn't, it didn't also help you know, in boosting up my courage to be like, oh, yeah, let's report this. Yeah. And I mean, finally, I think 
like I said, everybody has everybody has a coping mechanism. Everybody has a coping mechanism. For me, it's um, that I take responsibility. I don't know if you've ever met people who just take responsibility. Like that's the first thing they do before they do anything else. I mean, it's not always the right thing to do. Actually, for someone like me who, in if something similar had happened to a friend, I would have been like, no, you didn't do this. This wasn't your fault. I know that. I can tell people that. But when it came to me, I couldn't tell myself that. Mm. Maybe I still can't tell myself that. I don't know. But mm. it's something that I know. It's something that I believe. But it's a different thing when it applies to you. Right. It's a different thing when you're telling it back to yourself. So intellectually, you can know that you're not to blame. Yes, because emotionally. I mean, going there is not an invitation to rape me. Mm -hmm. It's not an invitation to let's have sex. Mm -hmm. I went there because they asked me to be there and it was my boss. I went there because I thought we had, you know, I, I thought that it was, some, it was someone I trusted, so I went there. So going there is not, that was the only thing I did. I went there, like I went to the house. Yes, that's what I did, really. And I think that, I mean, if it now comes to finding out what, so why do this now? Why come out anonymously and, you know, share the story that you didn't want to share? Because this is beyond me. This is way more than me. It's way more than me. I mean, if, 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 you, if there's anything that is more important to me now, it's, it's that this doesn't go on. And then I realized this isn't going anywhere. This is not going anywhere. I'm reminded of it every day because I see it on Twitter. I see people make memes and funny stuff about it. I also see people trivialize it. I see people doubt it. I see people defend it. So it's obviously not going anywhere. So it has to be dealt with. So I feel like if I can contribute, even if it's a fraction to this conversation, if I can let someone at least know that this is who this person is, as opposed to who he says he is, then that's something that you know, is worth doing this for. So this is beyond all um, I'm trying to, you know, um, come out now and put a face to myself or try to get, you know, some sort of, yeah, it's, it's because this is, this has gone on for too long. This is beyond anyone. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the people around us to let these conversations go on to let these stories be heard. No matter how people spin it, I don't think that people are going to not find a way to spin this. Yeah, Paul? Um, there's something you said that I found, and I, I wanted to go back to that. You said when, when a person is raped, <laughs> the first thing the person is thinking about is not justice, it's not exposing the person, mm -hmm. it's survival, yeah. it's self-preservation. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about self-preservation, like you said. You're thinking about, um, you know, making that switch to whatever your coping mechanism is. Whatever it is, you have to tell yourself to get yourself through the next minute, and then the next hour, and then the next day. So, I mean, depending on, I mean, we all cope differently, like I said. We all have different coping mechanisms. Yes, we all have different ways that we deal with issues. So, but at the prime of all of that is survival. That's what you're thinking about. You just want to, you know, yes. So, mm. I mean, there's a lot going on in your head. Mm. The, the amount of energy that you spend even trying to get yourself together, to tell that story back to yourself, the fact that you're living it, you know, you're living it every day, mm. is enough ordeal to go through and keep you busy, that you, you're not even thinking about, you know, and then, of course, you also think about the shame that is attached to it, the number of people that probably will not even believe you if you say it. So when you think about all of that, you start to think if it's worth it, if it's worth all that drama, or if it's something that you... And it's even worse when you're someone who likes to make a list of you know, things and see... Um, I mean, if you are the kind of person who weighs what your options are, or mm. if you're not kind of like the kind of person who just hastily decides something without thinking through it, the more you think through it, the more you give yourself reasons to not, you know, go out and say something to the next person. Mm. Because then you have to now deal with the fact that nobody believes you. So it's not just that you're dealing with something that, you know, could be, um, that is not just devastating, but I mean, is something that you're going to probably carry with you for the rest of your life. 
you're also now going to be dealing with what people say or how they're asking you questions and they're asking you to justify. I feel like that's a lot of load to put on victims. Mm. I don't know why we ask them for that. I don't know why we feel like people um, need to, the only way they can justify that something happened to them, you know, something as horrible as rape is to go out and find the nearest person to report to. I think people, I think that when you are in that state, there's a lot that is going on in your mind, but you really are just thinking about survival. Yeah. Yes. Um, Ma, you had mentioned that one of the reasons why you came out to talk about this yeah. is, but before that, let me yeah. ask, why are you anonymous? I'm anonymous because, um, one, if there's anything that I want more than anything right now, and I want a lot of things, but if there's anything I want that is really on you know, my top of list of things to have is to never have to do anything with these people ever. Is to never be associated with them. Is mm -hmm. to never have to have my name in the same sentence with them. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot to make sure that I've erased that part of my life. It's taken, it's taken me a long time. It's taken me relationships that I've had to cut off from. It's taken me you know, leaving a lot of people behind. So why do it now? Because that's taking me right back to where I started. And I know that, I mean, yeah, so being anonymous is my selfish way of choosing me. Yeah, it's really that simple. I just chose me. I don't want to be attached to that guy. I don't want to be in the same sentence with him. I don't want to, yeah, it's really just that simple for me, yeah. So as much as I want to be a selfless person who tells that story, as much as I want to be the co I mean the bold, courageous person who comes out and says, This is what I had to go through. And I know for a fact that this is what a lot of other people have had to go through. I know for a fact that this man is doing what they said he did because he did it to me and he's done it to a lot of several other people, taking advantage of the power he has, taking advantage of his office as pastor. As much as I want to do all of that, I also just want to stay anonymous because yeah. Um, I totally get that. Um, and you know, to be honest, you know, I mean, if I was being selfish, I'd have said, you know, I, 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 just listening to this story, and you know, with the producers, I know how we went back and forth. Okay. You said, you know, whether you're going to tell the story, you said, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I want to tell the story. I remember, I remember, you know, changing my mind, um, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, this, Mm. I, I told myself today, maybe this might be one of the most brave things I've ever had to do. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. I mean, it might just be. Mm. Maybe there's, there's still, mm. a, you know, a lot of things. Mm. But right now, I think this takes a kick. Yes. Yeah. And I struggled with it, even doing it anonymously, because mm -hmm. that would mean I have to relieve every okay. aspect of yeah. something that I'm trying so desperately to bury yeah. or forget yeah. or not have to ac acknowledge at least. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so. I mean, the, the thing that the viewers will miss from this conversation is, I mean, the range of emotion on your face as you yeah. talk about these things. And, you know, I, and I will have to report it to them. Like, you know, I mean, I just see your eyes. Yeah. I just see the pain, the flashes, the, yeah. the, the anger, the, 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 the pain, yeah? <laughs> Um, so I know it's actually. yes. I know that. This I think I think that what makes it even more painful is the fact that you start to think about how <laughs> you start thinking about how this happened to you, but you're not the only one that this happened to, and there's a huge possibility that you're no, they are also not going to be the only ones that this yes. will happen to. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Who is to say right now as we speak, there's not someone somewhere that is about to go through this? Because I actually, I don't know. You I think I think it's it's that much of a problem that even while this is going on, we can still be having problems. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. Yeah. That's how deeply rooted I think yeah. this is. Yeah. That's how serious I think this issue yeah. is. So I mean, that makes it even more painful. Yeah. And of course, when you think about how how much, um, how much of your actual self you poured into your work, mm -hmm. how much of your actual self you actually selflessly gave, how you, know, you ran with a vision because you were just a young girl who just wanted to, not just serve God, but you know, believe in someone's vision and just run with it. 
you, my producers, when they were recording the pre interview with you, they mentioned something you said for every woman who has a story about Biodun Fatuimbo in yeah. Koza, yeah. there was a young girl being groomed yeah. called Choice Daughter. Yeah, so I, I, I believe that strongly. And I, I, I think I included that part because I was thinking about the generation of you know, teenagers that we have mm. right now. I know a lot of teenagers in that face. I can actually see their faces right now. A lot of them were my friends. A lot of them were people who are so bright, amazing. They, I mean, they are spectacular in their different ways. And knowing who this person is, I know for a fact that something has to be done. I know that for as much as some of us are coming out to, to talk about the story, somewhere in there, there's a grooming going on. There's someone who has his eyes on, there's someone who has his sights on, there's someone who's already looking to, I don't know, it's messed up, but that's what it is. Mm. So that's why I said that. So, I mean, it's something that we can no longer just not want to deal with mm. because we feel like it's not, um, it's not close to us mm. because I think it's going to come close enough at some point. At some point. I mean, like how many people have to be hurt? How many people have to, how many, teenagers have to be broken before something actually happens, before this person gets put away, before something is actually done to at least repair whatever damage has been done. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's why I said that. I'm saying that because I know that even though now we have people who have come out to say this happened to me, there are still people who are probably, you know, in there, not even aware of everything that's going on. And an average teenager in Kosa wants to be like their pastor. Hmm. And I'm not even making this shit up. It's mm. sad, but it's the truth. They look up to him. They think he's the best thing. I mean, it's the ideal definition of who a pastor is. It's the ideal definition of who a role model is. And I'm not making this thing up. It's what it is. So does it make you now afraid that someone who could do all of these things, someone who could be this evil, is someone that children look up to. That's the part that bothers me That's because, part, yeah, it's really worrying. Yeah. So there are several levels of this story. Um, and, and so first is they're just young women and girls yeah. who need to be protected. Exactly. Urgently. Yeah. If, this, if this is true, we'll, then there's an urgent need to, to protect young exactly. women. Exactly. And uh, since we cannot say that we completely, you know, we can't say 100% that their parents are going to do it. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you can only do as much as you know. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so we need to give them the information they need to make a decision and take responsibility. But we're also saying that you can almost empathize with COSA members who struggle to, to come to terms with the truth. Because mm -hmm. when you are in that space, you can't yeah, so different. I think that there are levels to this thing. Mm. I, I feel like this is the point where I need to say it. Right. There are levels to this thing. If someone ever told me, for example, that um, my pastor raped someone, my reaction would not be to go and shout in church this morning, right? Mm. So there are levels to this thing. Right, right. So right. as much as I sympathize with them, I also, yes, think that there's a lot of extremes. They just need to receive sense, to yeah. be honest. And yeah. I was there, and as someone who has been there at some point, I mm. know that sometimes it's really just as simple as giving someone too much power that they now have too much power over you. Mm. The power that he has is something that was given. He didn't, like, I don't think he took it as much as we gave it to him. And I'm mm. saying we because I was there. Mm. And I see how much we revered him, how much we took everything that he said, like law, and how much, I mean, a lot of subtle things were said, like, oh, the most important person in your life is the person who builds your faith, meaning he's the most important person in your life, which isn't true. That's not true. That isn't true. I mean, that can't even be true, because if we're going by the standard of the most important person who in your life is the one who builds your faith, nobody builds anyone's faith. I don't think a man builds your faith. Mm -hmm. They can try to help your faith grow, but I think that's the work of the person of the Holy Spirit, if we're being religious here. Yeah, so I feel like those are the kind of things that have you know, led up to how fanatic people are and how they've chosen to rather you know, be in that ship and just sink with it with blindfolds on right. because they would rather not face 
the truth for what it is. Right. Yes. So they have to take responsibility for it's, their choices. It's really just that. It's really just that. Simple. And they step into the if, if 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 a man has been credibly accused. I mean, this has this has gone on for a for while. For too long. Yeah. So we, there's a burden on the church members themselves to take responsibility for the actions they take after the stories they hear. Yeah. So yes. I, I mean, I think as someone who has been in there mm. and who is now out and can look from the outside in, if there's anything that I would say to people who are still there is <sighs> everything that we do, right? Everything that you're supposed to do as a believer is supposed to be about love. I mean, it's supposed it's the foundation on which everything is based. And if that's absent, then what do you have? Then what do you have? Then what do you have? So um, love empathizes. Love does not seek its own way. I mean, love is supposed to let you hear something as horrible as a rape allegation against someone who was in a who was a teenager at the time it happened. Mm -hmm. And your first response should not be to take to social media and say, I stand with daddy. I think the most ridiculous thing to do is to see that someone, no matter how much you care about, we all want to believe the best in people we care about. I cared about this person once. I believed the best in him. Until, of course, I had to find out for myself, sadly, that people are usually not who they say they are. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's any different. The same way, you know, um, people surprise you and they say one thing and do another thing. It's the same thing here, except that, of course, God is involved, religion is involved, so it makes it more tangled and more right. Right. messed up. Yeah. And then finally, his wife, Modeli, you, if, if, if she defends him, according to what you're saying, we shouldn't be surprised. I'm actually, she's actually not surprised. actually defending herself as well. I'm actually not surprised. Yeah. I, I mean, there's hardly anything they do that surprises me, to be right. honest. Right. Yes, because I yeah. think I've seen it all. Of course, except I talked to the, your producer and mm. she said something and I was like, oh, okay, that's a new law. Yeah, but I feel like um, I, I can't be surprised that she supports him. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just because, oh, that's what a wife is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's because that's their life. Wow. They have, they both have um, everything to lose if that ship sinks. So it's about power, right? That's it. Right. That's it. I mean, she's, yeah. Uh. Yes, she's, she's as, uh, she has as much, maybe, maybe not as much, but she has it a lot of influence in that place as well. Mm -hmm. She has a lot of influence in that place as well. Mm -hmm. So she has a stick in it. And it's, just, it's not just a marriage stick. It's that this is mm -hmm. our life. And mm -hmm. it, it, we cannot allow it to sink to the ground. So whatever has to be done, if we have to put up appearances, if we have to you know, tell a few lies, maybe more than a few, but you get what I mean. Yeah, so whatever has to be done is just, do it. Whatever has to be done for the show to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this story. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.